At Mercy Village Church, we are loving, abiding, and going. That's how we state our core values concisely. But each of those three core values is stated in its own robust sentence that gets at the fuller meaning. So in this sermon series titled Roots and Fruits, we're examining each of our core values and the why and the what behind each one. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. In aviation, and uh, I think it holds true in, I mean, there's obviously a thousand other forces at work in uh, nautical travel as well, but it's something called uh, the 1 in 60 rule. Now, if you, uh, maybe you're familiar with that, maybe you're not. But the idea is if all the conditions, you know, no wind, not factoring wind or currents or anything like that, if you're traveling by air or by, or by sea, if you are one degree off in your heading, over 60 miles, you will end up one mile away from your destination. Okay, so that's um, a mile is a lot of distance. Um, but it might not seem like a big deal, but imagine you leave France headed for New York City and you're flying and you're one degree off to the south, you're going to end up in Philadelphia. That's a big difference. Uh, There's going to be a lot of uh, extra plans you're going to have to make to get yourself to, to New York. It's called the 1 in 60 rule. We have a heading as a church. The church has an overarching heading altogether. It's the Great Commission. That's where we're headed today, Matthew chapter 28. We've summed that up in our mission statement. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. That's our heading. That's the direction that we are going in as a church. And we've summed it up in some core values. That's what this Roots and Fruits is series has been all about. Core value number one, we are loved by God. That's the root. And we will love God fully and love people selflessly. That's the fruit. Our second core value, we are invited by Jesus. That's the root. And we will abide with him communally. That's the the fruit. And then lastly, and, and we started with the root of this core value last week, we are empowered by the Holy Ghost. We talked about that. And this week, as we close out this series, we see the final fruit of our core values. We will go outward boldly. So what we'll see today as we do this is that there is a commission, there is a heading, there is a direction for the people of God to go that the church is supposed to be on. And if we get just a little bit off course, right? If we begin to overvalue comfort, or if we begin to overvalue cultural relevance, or we begin to cater to consumerism or political correctness, or we elevate political party over allegiance to Christ, if we value keeping things the way that they've always been, and the list could go on and on and on for ways that churches just get a little bit off course. They're not denying the Trinity. They're not denying that Jesus is Savior. There's not these huge, massive shifts. But what happens is these small shifts, one degree here, two degrees there, three degrees there, can set a church on a course that is not in the direction of the Great Commission. And one day we wake up 20 years from now, if God allows Mercy Village Church to exist that long, And it's not really a church by the Bible's definition. It might be a social club that talks about Jesus. It might be a place where people gather and and they enjoy being together, but it won't be a church by God's definition. The Great Commission defines what the church is about. We don't get to define it. Culture doesn't get to define it. A political party doesn't get to define it. God defines it in his word through Jesus as he gives us the Great Commission. And that is against which we measure our success. So today, this is the takeaway. Disciples of Jesus make disciples of Jesus by the power of Jesus and in the presence of Jesus. And this mission trumps all others. That 
is what the church is all about. The Great Commission is in Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to be today looking at verses 16 through 20. The Great Commission is simple. It's not complex. You don't have to you know, have a seminary degree to understand the Great Commission. It's simple. But just as simple as it is, it's also impossible for us to fulfill it, for us to walk in it, apart from Jesus, from his power. And so we must be with him. So let's pray before we jump in. Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So we come on this final scene. So interestingly enough, last week we were in the final discourse of Jesus before the cross. Today we look at his final words before his ascension into heaven. This is the very last thing he will say. It won't be as much as the upper room discourse, which covers four chapters. His speech will actually here cover verses 18, 19, and 20, only three verses. And these will be his, his very final words before he ascends into heaven. Verse 16 sets the scene for us. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed. It's the Mount of Olives is where they are, uh, where Jesus had directed them. And so the disciples, in verse 16, we see where they were, where they had gone. They've gone to the Mount of, of Olives. There's likely other people there. We'll come back to that in a second. They're likely not the only ones there on the Mount of Olives. But they go. But if you go back a little bit further in chapter 28, you'll see something else interesting. Verse 16 shows us where they were. If you go back to verse 8, you begin, and, and some other verses as well, to see where they were not. So verse 8 through 10 of chapter 28 sets the scene. So they departed quickly from the tomb. This is Mary and Mary, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And they had great joy and they ran to tell his disciples. They had just discovered that the tomb was empty. The angels had revealed to them that Jesus was alive. And they go and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. So that's Easter. We're preparing for Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday came to them the very first time in this moment. Jesus was alive. And so they're turning flips with excitement. But while they're turning flips with excitement, there's something else that's happening. In verse 11, it says, while they were going, Mary and Mary, to tell the disciples, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave sufficient a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Make up this story, right? We're going to compensate you for it. We're going to bankroll this lie, but tell it. And if this comes to the governor's ears, right, that you were sleeping on the job, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And Matthew, as he's writing this, some 20 to 30 years later after the events, as he's recounting the story of Jesus with his pen and parchment, he says, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. There are people who continue to doubt and discredit the resurrection of, of Jesus. Here's the point I'm getting at. What has happened when we see where the disciples are instead of where they are not is we understand before Jesus even begins to talk in this passage that Jesus changes forsaking followers into faithful followers. You see, the money, the influence, and the power, right, by the world standards was not going to be on the Mount of Olives. The money came of lies. The money came with forsaking Jesus. The influence and the power, right, on paper, the way it would have looked, would have been that that would come in forsaking Jesus, but yet they followed him. They met him where he had told them to meet him. But if you go back to chapter 26, you don't see faithful followers. You see these men getting out of town as fast as they can as the soldiers sweep into Gethsemane and they capture Jesus. Judas kisses him and betrays him with that kiss. 
And the soldiers cart him off, and one by one they all flee and forsake. Peter even denies and forsakes. That's who they were. But by chapter 28, that's no longer who they are. God has changed forsaking followers into faithful followers. They weren't among the influencers or the wealthy or the strong, but they were following after Jesus. And if we will ever be marked as a people, as folks who go outward boldly, then we uh, must have Jesus transform us as well. I don't know about you, but I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to um, see other things as valuable. To set my course just a little bit off of where Jesus is calling me to go. And to chase after other things. I need Jesus to change me, a fleeing follower, into a faithful follower. So we see that in the context. Verse 17 shows us another thing. It says, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. There were two types of people on the mountain. The mountain of olives, who would now hear this great commission. Those who were worshipping... And those who were doubting. Now, there's no scholarly consensus as to who the doubters were. There's not even scholarly consensus about who was on that mountain. Now, what I mean is everybody who studied this and kind of pieced all of these different passages together that talk about these final moments of Jesus and have looked at the original languages and all of that stuff and church history, they try to piece together who was up there on that mountain. And all we know for sure is the 11 disciples. But there's a lot of... of speculation or evidence that would lead us to believe, not with 100% certainty, that, that potentially Mary, Jesus' mother was there, Jesus' brothers were there on the mountain, and likely others as well. So among those people, however many there were, we don't know who was doubting and who was worshiping. But what we do know is who had been doubting. All of them. Every single one of those people on that mountain, regardless of who was there, had been doubting. We know Thomas had. He'd heard of the resurrection and he still doubted. He said, I want to put my hand in his side and I want to see the, the nail marks in his hands. Then I'll believe. We know that Mary and the other Mary had doubted as well. Now, my evidence for that is that they're going to prepare the body, which is a very loving kind gesture but if you believe that this body's coming back to life in three days completely restored who cares right why waste your time and energy and money caring for a body that's going to be resurrected by the power of god the disciples are all uh, hold up for fear of the jews they think they're next if you believe that your king and savior is going to resurrect from the dead you're walking around with a little bit more confidence. And you might say they didn't understand. And you'd be right. They didn't understand what Jesus had said when he said, I will be raised from the dead in three days. They didn't get it. But one of the reasons they didn't get it is because they doubted that it was even possible. So they had all doubted. Everyone on that mountain was a doubter. Everyone in this room, including me, has been there too. Another interesting thing that I find here is by not defining exactly who it was that was doubting, it leaves room for what I think is a very human experience. That there are times when I worship and there are times when I doubt. One person, two responses. Sometimes I worship, sometimes I doubt. But the good news is Jesus turns doubters into worshipers. Jesus turns fleeing followers into faithful followers. And so Jesus hasn't even started talking yet. We're about to jump into his words in verse 18. But we already have reason to rejoice. Because we have a Savior who takes the faithless and he gives them faith. He takes those who are scared and he gives them courage to follow after him. And we're going to need it because the Great Commission is coming. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is his final dialogue. These are his final words. And the first thing I want us to notice is that the Great Commission is bookended by the power and the presence of God. Verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In the end of the Great Commission, he'll say, and lo, I am with you always. 
It begins with God, and it begins with Jesus, and it ends with Jesus. Jesus is the power at the, at the front end, and he is the presence at the back end. First, we see his authority. It's positional authority. It's given to him by the Father, right? So, that, so uh, all through Jesus' ministry, we see him submitting to the Father, submitting to the Father, submitting to the Father. Now he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There's a positional authority that has been, been given to him by the Father. It's a powerful authority. He doesn't have some of it. He has all of it, all authority. And it's also, it's also prolific. It's everywhere. It's in heaven and on earth. So he has the power. Here's what I want us to see from verse 18. When we think about our own personal lives, what it means for us to make disciples, for us to evangelize, for us to share the good news of Jesus with others, a lot of times we get hung up and we get scared. I'll, I'll just throw myself under the bus. I do. I don't know what to say. What if I come off weird? What if my posture is wrong? What if I don't have the answers to these tough questions? Can I set us free this morning from that? We don't need fancy words. We don't need all the answers. We need the power of Jesus. His authority. His strength. His power. We're a room full of church planters, by the way. I want us to, to own that identity as, as a core team. Those of you who are regularly attending. Those of you who are part of the core team. This church isn't being planted by Josh Early and, and Paul Bukel. This church is being planted by all of us. We are the church planters. And in this room full of church planters who are actively uh, working to see a church established for the glory of God and the, and the fame of Jesus, we don't need a fancy facility. They sell this building and we end up having to meet in a tent. Be fine. We don't need an impressive gathering. Where everything flows together and Pastor Paul gets the slots just right. Thank God. We don't need that. We don't need a trampoline park in the kids' ministry. Although it might sound like we have one up there. We don't need to be slick. We don't need to be impressive. Listen, we're putting a bunch of eggs in this Easter basket. <laughs> wow. I, just, that, that was, I didn't even mean for that pun to come out. Yeah, I'm just so naturally full of great dad humor. <laughs> We're excited to be able to meet outside on Easter Sunday. Our first truly public kind of advertised gathering of the church plant. It's kind of soft launch into this community. We've got all the plants. We've got our sound stuff lined up. We had worship practice in here this week. And what if it rains? And we're kind of have to come back in here. How disappointed are we going to be? We don't need good weather on Easter. We don't need good singing on Easter. Thank God we don't need good preaching on Easter. We need the power of Jesus. That's what we need. His authority, his power, his presence. Against Jesus, the gates of hell will never prevail against him. Not a single one of us can say that. Can say that we're more powerful than the, than the gates of hell. Only Jesus. We need his power, not our own strength. And so our next best step always as a church plant, every single time, the next best step that we can always take is to surrender ourselves to the power and presence of Jesus. I'm serious. We're, I mean, that's so not human. Right? That's so not like us. We're going to try to control. We're going to try to make things better. We're going to try to work things out. We're going to try to insert ourselves in to every situation in life. It's who we are. And very few times do we even make the very first step saying, God, you have to take this. Jesus, without you, this fails. But that's our next best step every single time. So he says, go. Go outward boldly. This is my power that I'm giving to you, and your next step is to go. Now, if you've uh, heard someone preach on this passage before, you've heard this, or, or if you've studied it, and even a book study, that this is, uh, these words here could easily be translated, as you are going, make disciples. It comes off like a command, like an imperative, go. But it's actually in the original language, a participle attached to making disciples. 
Making disciples is the greatest imperative of this verse and of this series of verses. But the going's not an afterthought. That's not what that means. It doesn't mean that the, that the going is, a, is an afterthought. This is actually a very complex uh, verse in the original language, and I'm not super gifted at understanding the original language, but I can read other people who understand the original languages. And there's, there's a lot of stuff written here that says that although that go, therefore, does not carry the same force as make disciples, it still carries enough force that we need to be mindful of the intentionality in our going. It's not just we're wandering around wherever, wherever we end up in this life, we make disciples. That's not the nature of it. It's wherever you go in this life, be intentional as you're going. The relationships that you're uh, investing in the people that you're bringing into your home, the places that you're going on, on, in your free time, the places you're investing your money as you as you're able to mobilize other ministries. Be intentional as you are going. He says, "Go, therefore." It's not flippant. It's very intentional. If we will be marked by going outward boldly, we cannot sit. We must go. We must be headed somewhere. He says, go therefore and make disciples. This is the imperative here. Mathiteo is translated two ways. Be disciples and make disciples. And I think that's great. Because you can't have one without the other. And this call to make disciples is also the call to be disciples. We must be followers of Jesus if we can, can call anyone else to follow Jesus. And this is the imperative of the whole passage. The maximum, the, 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 the biggest takeaway, the biggest call of this entire commission is make disciples. Okay. That's it. If you boil down the church into two words, those would be the two words you'd boil it down to. Make disciples. Disciples are followers of Jesus. Disciples are people who have answered Jesus' call from Matthew chapter 11, where he said, uh, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Disciples are those who have believed that promise. Although maybe sometimes we doubt, but we believe that promise and we have taken up our cross and we have taken up the yoke of Jesus and we are following after him. And what does it mean to make disciples? It means to invite others to do the same. To invite others to take up that yoke, to take up that cross and follow after Jesus. We'll get into what that looks like here in just a second, maybe in some specific ways, but, but there's no need to overcomplicate it. It's that simple. It's not easy. But it's simple. Follow Jesus and invite other people to follow Jesus. That's what the Great Commission is all about. If we be marked as a people of God who go as people who go outward boldly, we must first be disciples, and we must be uh, making disciples. Who do we make disciples of? All nations. I love this part. We must be facing outward. That's where that language comes and that core value. That we would be going outward boldly to all the nations. This isn't a call just to global missions. It's a call to go outward. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus will say these words. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's if, if our core, third core value could be summed up by one scripture verse, it would be that. The power of the Holy Spirit given to the people of God to go and make disciples in J Jerusalem, which have been like the hometown, right? So for some of you that's Huntington or Barbersville right now or Ona or, or Proctorville or wherever it is that you hang your hat. Your cul-de-sac, your neighbors, your people there. Judea is... A little bit further out, like Cabell County or West Virginia, it's like kind of extending the borders of, of your mindfulness of, of where you live your life. Samaria is the people you don't like. That's Morgantown or... Um, right now for me, it's anyone who works for West Virginia American Water. I'm going to tell you about that later. 
But, but, but those are the people that you're not comfortable being around. The Samaritans would have been people that the Jews would have intentionally stayed away from. Into the ends of the earth. Right? So to go outward, the reason we didn't say go global in this core value is because that's not the whole understanding of the Great Commission. We must be going across the street and across the ocean. We must be going across town and to the nations. We must be going to dark places and bright places, dirty places and clean places. The Great Commission is for everyone. All faces, every shade of melanin, every one. The Great Commission is for all people. And so may our tables at home look like some mashup of the United Nations and the DMV, right? Because we're living our lives as people who go even where we are to all people. And might our checkbook, right, although it certainly will include us giving and mobilizing mission where we are, may there also be evidence that we're thinking beyond where we are as well. That we're looking to the nations. That we're looking to the work that God is doing in the, in the furthest places. So go to all the nations. And he says, baptize them. People must be transformed, right? Go to all the nations. That sounds super loving. And that's great because there's love in the kingdom of God. But where things begin to get interesting is when you start to tell folks that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And we should do that graciously, lovingly, gently, kindly. But even if you do that perfectly, with utmost love, there will be people who, when you say those words to them, they'll be disgusted by it. They'll be upset by it. But you know what else? There'll be others who when they hear those words and God opens their heart to that truth, their lives will be transformed. That word baptized comes from this idea that back uh, in Jesus' day, if you wanted a purple shirt, you didn't go to Walmart or Amazon.com and find a purple shirt and order it. You went and got a, a white piece of cloth, or if you had enough money, a white piece of cloth that somebody had stitched into a shirt or a, a tunic, and then you would buy some dye and you would baptize that shirt into that purple dye, and when you pulled it out, it would have been transformed. The identity of that shirt would have been transformed from white to purple. Baptism testifies to a transformation of the very identity of who we are. We've been changed into new people. So... The Great Commission says go with the transforming power of the gospel. Baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is seen there as well. If we're going to be people who are marked by going outward boldly, we must proclaim the transforming power of the gospel. I stand up here as a man who's very weak at doing that. Sharing the gospel with those in my family and friends. But, but the Great Commission doesn't let me off the hook. The Great Commission puts me on the hook to grow in that. Might all of us be growing in that. Verse 20 says teaching them. So there's two aspects to making disciples. We proclaim the transforming power of the gospel. People's lives are transformed. And then we begin to teach and educate. We take the things that we know about what it means to follow Jesus. And we help other people learn those things as well. While we're being disciples who are continually learning what it means to be like Jesus, we bring other people along and teach them what it means to be like Jesus. Teaching them. And what content specifically? It's right there. To observe all that I have commanded you. Every single thing that Jesus taught, that's the curriculum. Now know this, by the way, that Jesus said that knowing all things. He knew all the culture shifts that were ahead he knew all the political landscapes that would rise and fall. He knew everything about cancel culture. He knew everything uh, about things that would be called. Whatever our culture is doing right now, he knew it all. And he said, take this all, all of my teachings and proclaim them. Knowing that things like love your neighbor, everybody would jump it with excitement about that. Not a whole lot of people offended by that. Now, when we have to do it in real life, it can be a little bit offensive but the idea we're all on board for it everyone love your neighbor 
and things like take up your cross and follow after me. I am the only way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. Those don't go over quite as big, but Jesus says all of it. All of the truth must be proclaimed, must be taught, every single bit of it. It's tough. The Great Commission isn't easy. It's simple. Follow Jesus and invite other people to follow Jesus. It's that simple. But it's not easy. It's difficult. And that's why we have this final bookend. Behold, I am with you. The presence of Jesus with us as we pursue to walk in faithfulness to the Great Commission. We're not alone. The Great Commission starts with his power and it ends with his presence. We're not alone. No matter how you feel today, if you're in Christ, you're, you're not alone. He's with you. Your relationship with Jesus matters deeply as you seek to walk in the Great Commission. And how long is he with us? Always. To the end of the age. That says to me that the Great Commission is something we never graduate from. Like we never get to a place in our Christian walk where the Great Commission is no longer relevant to us. It is the destination. All of our actions as a church, all of our actions as individuals should be shaped by that direction. We never graduate from it. And it's something we go to the end of our lives doing. We die with our boots on seeking to walk in uh, obedience to the Great Commission. And the good news is, all the way to the point where we take our last breath, Jesus walks with us. And not just with us, but with all of our disciples that we, by God's grace, have had the opportunity to invest in, who outlive us to the end of the age. Jesus continues to walk with all of his disciples. If we'll ever be marked as people who are going outward boldly, we must be prepared for the lifelong pursuit of obeying the Great Commission, knowing that Jesus is with us. So that's the whole thing. It's not complex. Evangelize people, proclaim the gospel to them, equip people, help them to know more and more what it looks like to follow Jesus. Make disciples, teach disciples. It's essential. But if we own these things, if we believe these things, if we set this as our main heading as Mercy Village Church, if we set this as our main heading as individual followers of Jesus, then it doesn't matter how fast we grow. It doesn't matter how big we grow. It doesn't matter how finely oiled of a machine we become as a, as a church if we do these things, these simple things. Day after day after day, we will be successful. Maybe not by the world's standards, but by God's standards. So might we go to the end that way. And the good news is baked into the Great Commission. As we pursue this, he turns doubters into worshipers. As we pursue this, he turns fleeing followers into faithful followers. He transforms our lives. As we seek to teach others, he teaches us. As we seek to bring life-transforming truth in other people's lives, He continues to transform our lives. It's all about Jesus. It always has been. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. See if this sounds familiar. This is right after the lion's den, most famous part of the book of Daniel. Now we get into the weird stuff. Daniel starts to have all these dreams and visions and prophecies, but the, one of the earlier ones is a lot easier to understand. He sees the Ancient of Days, God the Father, sitting on a throne. And then in verse 13, it says, And I saw in the night visions, this is another vision that he had, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This is Jesus. He is looking into the future and seeing Jesus in this vision. And it says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And then we watch it happen in Matthew. He came to them and he said, All the dominion, all the authority, the kingdom is mine. Daniel was right. Daniel might not have seen it happen this way 
on the Mount of Olives, but he knew something was coming. And everything he prophesied came true. Go therefore to all and make disciples of all the nations. Right? All those that would serve him from every tribe and tongue and nation prophesied in Daniel. It's going to happen. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And how long to the end of the age. Behold, I am with you always. Jesus, God's Son. The fulfillment of every promise that God has ever made. Lived a perfect life. No sin in Him. Died on the cross. A death that I deserved and you deserved. And through faith, in that finished work on the cross, you can be saved today if you're not a Christian. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Three things for the children of God as we close. Stay close to Jesus. Go. Go. And keep it simple. Here's what I mean. First, stay close to Jesus. That's boiled down to its, to its uh, finest point, what it means to be a disciple. Stay close to Jesus. There's a million ways that you can do that. We've had this first things first commitment from the beginning of the year that some of us jumped into. The idea being that, that we would commit for every day for the rest of the year. And we wrote it that way on purpose so you can jump in today if you hadn't started. Or you can get back on the, the horse and keep pursuing it if you if you drop the ball. But that we would start every single day with scripture and prayer before anything else. It might only be two minutes, right? It might be uh, Jesus wept, shortest verse in the Bible, God I need you, and then on with your day. It might be an hour. But to start in that place every single day. Day. That's the idea of staying close to Jesus. Sabbath rest, taking time to actually cease from striving and cease from doing so that we can rest in the reality that Jesus is in control. His authority and his power is what accomplishes things. Being in community with Christians. And on and on the list could go. The disciplines of this life that, that sometimes we neglect are actually ways of staying close to Jesus being his disciples. Number two, go. For much of our time, we are where we are. What I mean by that is where your kids play sports and uh, where you work and where your family lives and, and uh, who your friendships have kind of have, have developed over time determines a lot of our going and coming. Uh, the jobs that we do, the hobbies that we pursue. And so most of our lives, right, it almost feels like it's predetermined. We're just kind of going through these motions of here's what I do on Tuesday and here's what I do on Friday and this is it. But while you're going, be intentional. We talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and it's a really hard thing to wrap our brains around. But, but if you've been a Christian for very long, maybe you've had that experience where you have felt a nudge of the Spirit towards somebody in the places you normally go to. Someone who appears to be hurting. Someone who appears to be broken. Maybe it's someone who is in, in deep need of uh, assistance of some kind. And you felt that nudge towards them. Obey the Holy Spirit in your normal day-by-day -day rhythms of your going. Be intentional with who you engage with and who you uh, participate with. But the balance of our time, like right, and, and we each have a, maybe a different amount of balance after that, we do get to choose a lot about maybe what we do with the balance of that time. Be intentional with that too. Who you invite into your home, what relationships you're going to invest in, what are you going to do if your parents with your kids to help disciple them, to help them know about who Jesus is and, and what he's done. Are there people in your uh, life who you could bring close to you and, and just walking out this life together over coffee or in front of the TV watching football games? You could invest in their lives to help them know Jesus better and to know what it looks like to walk with him more closely. Go. That's what it means. And beyond that, and this is certainly there, and I don't want to gloss over it today. We barely mentioned it, but we must be thinking beyond our scope, too. There are hundreds of organizations that God has placed all over the world who are doing work, and many of them are mobilized with very little money because the exchange rate of the U.S. dollar to the Guatemalan currency or the Ugandan currency or the Haitian currency is astronomical. 
the work that can be done simply by giving to these organizations is astronomical. And there's also opportunities to go and see and participate. Don't take any of that off the table, right? Like that not, might not be where you're called to right now, but never stop thinking about the nations. Never stop thinking that God's plan is for every tribe and tongue and nation. And allow God to work on your heart, leading you for how you might send others as they go and how you yourself may go. And then last, keep it simple. Let's not overcomplicate this. Love Jesus. Walk with Jesus, invite other people to walk with Jesus. That's it. It's that simple. Disciples of Jesus make disciples of Jesus by the power of Jesus and in the presence of Jesus. And this mission trumps all others, and so may that be our heading. And whenever we notice drift... Right? Whether it's you, right, as a member or a future deacon or a pastor in this church, may we be quick to raise our hand, to draw attention to it and say, hey, we're off mission, we're drifting. Because in 60 years, one degree of mission drift means we're not a church. So now we stay focused on the mission. Our core values have, have taken their cues from the Great Commission. To be a disciple of Jesus, you must know first and foremost, above anything else, that you're loved by God. And the number one thing you must do as a disciple of Jesus is love God fully with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. First core value. And then, as we're making disciples of others, that must be rooted in love for others. What's it mean to be a disciple to abide with Him? Jesus invites us in. Second core value. Invites, uh, we are invited by Jesus and we will abide with him communally. That falls out of the Great Commission. And lastly, of course, that empower, be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We will go outward boldly. This is who we are. The root of every one of these is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the fruit is simple. Point people to Jesus. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. May that be what we're marked by. So as we close this series and move into uh, some, a series that talks about the resurrection and, and its application to our lives, may we not move away or forget or neglect these, these core values. May they shape us as Mercy Phillips Church for the glory of God. In the name of Jesus. Father, thank you so much that you can take one of the, a, a, a pretty famous passage that many of us have probably heard sermons on before. And, and as we hear it again, it, it can be tempting to kind of zone out a little bit. But, but may, may you take it and impress it upon our hearts, the very simple nature of following after your son Jesus and inviting others to do the same. And then may you grant us wisdom individually in each of our own specific situations for how that looks like. Who are the specific people we will move towards uh, to share the gospel with them so that they might be saved? Who are the other specific people who are children of God or who are Christians who we will move to towards to help them to learn more what it means to follow after Jesus? What trans, uh, transformation needs to happen in our lives so that we can be more faithful followers of you, that you will reveal to each person in here those specific things and you will give us the power to change. That we will be marked as people who go outward boldly with the truth of the gospel. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening, and if you haven't already, we would love for you to join the work of God as Jesus Builds Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at our website at www.mercyvillage.church.